We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. Buongiorno. Dzień dobry, everyone. Welcome. My name is Michael Ogia. I'm the Director of External Relations at the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, as well as the Steering Committee member of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, IRPC for short. This workshop is co-organized by us, the IRPC, and the Digital Constitutionalism Network. And it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome you. So this year marks the 10th anniversary of our charter, our being the IRPC's charter of human rights and principles for the internet. Over the past decade, the IRPC Charter's 21 articles have been distilled into 10 broad principles and are available in 26 languages. They've also been used by different stakeholder groups all over the globe in their efforts to promote human rights in the online environment and inspired, and have inspired rather, other human rights documents, specifically within the ICT sector. The IGF has been, for so many years, a crucial space where civil society can come together and advocate for human rights respecting policy and technology, in part because for so long, few alternatives existed. Where are we now, however, in a time when the rate of technological development is pushing the boundaries of the possible, but also legal and ethical? <laughs> What concrete impacts of our advocacy within the IGF on the internet have emerged? And importantly, how will the COVID-19 era impact human rights online going forward as well? Within this scope, we will explore how digital human rights documents which emerged within the IGF or were inspired by the work of the IGF community can support the UN Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, support the promotion of human rights online, and help achieve the sustainable de development goals. It will focus on selected documents and analyze how they emerged, how they translated existing human rights law and norms to the online environment, and they will reflect on their relevance, achievements, and main challenges. My, so I am just going to be the MC of the session, making sure that especially everyone here in the room can, um, can contribute to the discussion as much as possible. And we have wonderful, uh, wonderful um, moderators online who will be guiding us through the, the discussion along with um, some really wonderful speakers. So with that said, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator for part one, Claudia Padovani from the University of Padova. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all um, in order to moderate the first uh, session of this uh, event this morning. So the session is titled IGF-led human rights, how they come out, concrete impact and relevance in the current COVID-19 era. This will be a round table. Um, we will have time for questions and answers. So you're very welcome to use the chat space uh, to insert your comments or your question as we move on with our uh, speakers. And unfortunately, we received notice this morning that two of the speakers uh, will not be with us. So uh, with us this morning are indeed uh, Marianne Franklin from Goldsmith University in London. And she is here to tell us the story the Charter of Internet Rights and Principle. And also with us is Edeta Enojo from the Secretariat of the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedom. I see you're both uh, with us uh, uh, in the virtual room. So thank you so much for having accepted this invitation. And we will move on in two minutes. With us, we're also supposed to be Parminder Jit Singh from the JustNet Coalition and IT for Change. And he would have reported about the Just Net Coalition and the Delhi Declaration. Uh, but unfortunately, for personal reason, he cannot join the session this morning. And also, fortunately, Rike Frank Jorgensen from the Danish Institute of Human Rights uh, 
um, will not be with us, uh, and she would have reported the experience of the Council of Europe Guide to Human Rights uh, for Internet Users. So we were wondering if Wolfgang Benedict uh, is maybe in the room. If he is, uh, he be invited informally to maybe uh, share with us a few comments uh, from the Council of Europe experience. But with that said, uh, we have more time for our uh, wonderful speakers. So they were invited uh, to comment uh, on a, a number of questions that will be posed. Uh, maybe you can take uh, two minutes and a half to answer each question instead of two minutes as initially uh, uh, considered. And I think with that, we can certainly start. So the first question for our speakers, uh, which really is about learning how these uh, meaningful documents have come about. So what was the context, atmosphere, and also the background and also kind of actors that have uh, uh, gathered together in order to elaborate uh, such uh, documents. And, and of course, also where do these documents sit in the longer uh, tradition of uh, inter international human rights uh, documents? So Marianne Franklin, maybe you can go first. You have the floor, thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, first of all, may I wish everybody a happy and uh, happy, if that's the right word, International Human Rights Day. This is the 10th of December and we are in International Human Rights Day. So the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, which I hold up in its English booklet edition, uh, got off the ground in 2009. Drafting process took up to two years. It was an attempt a successful attempt within the Internet Governance Forum space to get all sectors, tech community, corporate representatives, academics, lawyers, uh, governmental representatives, and very much importantly, civil society organizations to translate and interpret existing international human rights documents so that they spoke and resonated with the emergence of our digital lives. 10 years ago, this was not an obvious proposition. Uh, the Charter is modeled on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It collates, curates, and revises these essential documents, which go right down to the fourth generation of rights that the UN um, organization has put together and uh, member states have uh, endorsed. And in that respect, um, it's a bridging document. It's a, um, it's a, vehicle, it's a backbone, it's a point of reference, and it's a point of account, and it's a source of accountability. So it's been going 10 years. It has, to a large extent, helped address the disconnect at the time and suspicion, mutual suspicion, about where human rights, particularly human rights advocacy, um, and technical, technological advances through internet technologies, where they're actually connected. There are still many schools of thought who believe they are not connected. Uh, but the Charter is one of the documents, along with the Marco Seville, the Guide to uh, Human Rights from the uh, Council of Europe and many others, that show how this connection is actually already in law and just needs to be teased out of the woodwork, so to speak, uh, uh, put into relief and made speak to uh, those who have to deal with the legal, technical and cultural consequences of our online and offline uh, digital lives that are now totally interconnected. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for very clear, concise, uh, and also for highlighting how these documents can really be bridging uh, tools. So the same question is posed to Edith and uh, Ojo, I guess um, you can hear us and you have the floor. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, very good, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the African Declaration on Internet Rights and uh, Freedoms emerged against the background where on the African continent, we were seeing uh, a rush of laws and policies from many different uh, countries seeking to govern various aspects of the internet and internet activities. Unfortunately, um, the vast majority of these laws were not uh, human rights respecting and uh, seemed to take a punitive approach towards everything. So we thought that uh, it was a good idea to put in place a set of principles that would guide uh, law and policy making around 
uh, the internet in a manner that would be human rights respecting and also to guide uh, advocacy by civil society and other stakeholders. So the declaration emerged um, from this idea uh, that was discussed by a handful of internet rights advocates at the sidelines of the African Internet Governance Forum, uh, which we call the African IGF, that took place in uh, Nairobi, uh, in Kenya, in 2013. So the idea really was to provide guidance for advocates, policymakers through uh, a pan-African initiative that would promote human rights standards and principles uh, in the formulation and implementation of policies, uh, both at the national level, but across the continent. So in February of uh, 2014, uh, a larger meeting was convened in Johannesburg and um, Henriette played a, a key role in facilitating that meeting. Uh, which discussed this idea. Uh, we were able to reach agreement on some of the key elements of the document and uh, to agree on a process for developing uh, those uh, principles. At that meeting, we also agreed on the name of the document. Uh, we decided to call it the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms. And uh, I was charged with leading a small uh, drafting group to produce a first draft of the declaration. And essentially, this process entailed uh, distilling the principles and standards uh, to be contained in the declaration from a variety of documents that were already in existence that had been approved through various uh, processes. And therefore, uh, these principles, these standards were not um, in dispute. They were not controversial because they already existed uh, in different contexts and uh, different instruments. Uh, we were merely uh, pulling them together and um, in, in some cases where they were not specifically on the internet or digital issues, um, applying those same principles that had been established. So from the development of the text then uh, was then followed by uh, comments from organizations that were represented at the Johannesburg uh, meeting, uh, which were uh, slightly over 30 uh, organizations, principally from civil society, but also from other stakeholder groups. Uh, we had wanted to have government uh, participate, but uh, unfortunately, uh, apart from NIPAD, uh, which is uh, a regional body, uh, there was really no participation from government entities. Um, the, the comments from uh, um, participants were then followed by comments from a variety of experts from Africa and beyond. And then we had an online public consultation process and then uh, advocacy meetings with individuals and organizations from different African and international stakeholder groups, including bodies like UNESCO, uh, the UN, um, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, who was at that time David Kay, and so on and so forth. So uh, that was really how the process um, uh, unfolded. Now, the declaration builds on well-established African human rights documents, including uh, documents like the African Unfortunately, this connection is not very stable. So we hope that at the time we come back. And I'm afraid we can't hear him anymore. Hmm. So maybe as we wait for the time um, to go, get back with us, uh, uh, maybe we can move to our second question to Marianne. Um, and the second question really is uh, about uh, what happens uh, with a document like this uh, after it emerges. And so, of course, uh, it's very difficult to talk about impact, uh, even, even more uh, to, to attempt uh, measuring impact. Uh, but certainly, as we follow the life of documents that have been there for such a long time and have been integrated and updated, it's crucial also to consider what has been uh, 
their um, relevance in maybe strengthening the community around uh, not just the IGF uh, uh, space, uh, but also beyond. So how do you see the life of the document these days? And you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I would just like to bring into the discussion the a guide to human rights from the Council of Europe, because that was one of the first um, uh, developments of the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. Uh, and so we have, in fact, three, uh, three documents, uh, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, the Guide to Human Rights uh, for Internet Users from the Council of Europe, which was released in 2014, and of course, the Marco Seville, the Brazilian uh, human rights uh, framework, extremely important work. And all three helped each other, inspired each other, and piggybacked, if I might say, in a productive way off each other. So the main way uh, the charter is at the moment being disseminated is in its booklet form and through the 10 rights and principles. Note, this is the charter of human rights and principles for the internet. So it's very much speaks to existing and emerging uh, international human rights standards as they are articulated online and at the online offline nexus. So the booklet form has really helped disseminate the charter digitally. Uh, in digital form and very much in hard copy, which has been very successful. It is now in 12 languages, 11 official uh, house style, a uh, one through the Russian, our Russian colleague, and two on the way, Nepalese and Georgian. Um, it's been in political institutions, the New Zealand Green Party used um, the 10 rights and principles and the charter itself as the backbone for their launching of a digital policy. Uh, the Spanish Senate has been introduced to the charter in its physical form, in its Spanish edition. Uh, we've seen it in educational settings, Syry Syracuse law, uh, law School and our Italian colleagues uh, in three universities or two universities in Italy and at Dublin University in, uh, in Ireland and in the UK. Um, in internet governance spaces, the charter is spoken to, from and referred to in various ways, implicitly and explicitly at Eurodig, European Dialogue and Internet Governance Meetings. Uh, at the Net Mundial, the charter was given, um, um, how shall I put it, it was flagged or tagged, as we now say. Uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency has considered the charter in light of other uh, human rights standards for the online space. The Council of Europe is a very important partner because uh, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition is an official observer at the Council of Europe's uh, Steering Committee on the Information Society and Media, or Media and Information Society, uh, at the UN, UNESCO, and of course the UN Human Rights Council through its special rapporteurs have been extremely important, uh, just five more seconds, extremely important um, to helping the writing and the, and the dissemination of the charter keep close to its authoritative uh, sources, uh, namely uh, the special rapporteurs on the right to the freedom of expression. And more recently, the new special rapporteurs, the inaugural special rapporteur on the right to privacy and at municipal level, which we will hear about from uh, our colleagues uh, at Amsterdam. Um, the chart has been helpful there and we're very pleased to have been part of that launch of the Digital Cities Coalition, if I've got the name right. So that's it for now. Um, I'll find a copy of the Council of Europe guide in a minute and show you on screen. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for, for mentioning all these different uh, uh, spaces and different levels. Also, thanks for mentioning university activities that we've done with students. And I can anticipate that in my upcoming course, uh, we will again be looking at the charter and maybe developing some new ideas. Uh, so more to come on that space. Uh, I wonder if Edeta managed to get back to us. Um, can you hear? Yes, I'm okay. back on. I'm yes, I'm back on. Uh, apologies the, for the... No, the question was a bit unstable. So actually you were interrupted uh, when, when you were highlighting the, the human rights standards that the declaration has been inspired. You may take it from there and then go into my second question, which is more about what has been the, the effectiveness and how it has been used and how it has been picked up by other actors and spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And apologies for the um, interruption. Um, so uh, as I was saying previously, uh, the declaration uh, sought to build on established uh, human rights standards and principles uh, taken as a um, source, uh, human rights instruments on the African continent, principally the African Charter on Human and People's Rights uh, adopted in 1981, uh, the Vinduk Declaration 
1991, which ultimately led to uh, World Press Freedom Day that is now celebrated on, on the 3rd of May around the world. And um, it, the 10th anniversary document of the Vinduk Declaration, uh, which is the African Charter on Broadcasting, and then um, a, a major human rights document on freedom of expression adopted by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in 2002, uh, which is the Declaration of Principles of Freedom of Expression in Africa, uh, which was recently updated uh, after a revision in 2019. And then, of course, we also had uh, the African Platform on Access to Information Declaration that was adopted in uh, 2011. So all of these um, had already established in various ways uh, freedom of expression around um, uh, uh, both offline and online. And uh, this declaration sought to build on all of those. So um, in, in terms of the second question, uh, we adopted a variety of strategies in trying to uh, disseminate this. So one of the things we uh, agreed on very early on was that this was not an official document of any regional body or um, indeed any country. So we decided that we needed to um, get endorsements from those sort of uh, regional bodies as well as national governments in order to enhance the status of the declaration and give it the profile that we thought would be uh, useful in its achieving the objective that we outlined in the beginning. So we got endorsements from bodies like uh, UNESCO, from the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. And then uh, we went about launching the declaration at the national level in different countries. And through that process, we got a number of national governments to endorse it. Uh, the declaration was first launched at the night um, IGF, which took place in Istanbul in 2014. And then we also uh, relaunched it at uh, the Highway Africa Conference in South Africa the same year. That's an annual gathering of media stakeholders and other information activists. Uh, uh, and we thought that it was a great opportunity to uh, present that document to stakeholders within the African continent. And then um, again, at the 10th IGF that took place in Brazil in 2015. So it's been launched at um, the national level in many different countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as the uh, West African IGF. It was uh, presented to the global freedom of expression community at the General Conference of IFEX, uh, International Freedom of Expression, uh, exchange, which is a coalition or a network of freedom of expression organizations uh, from around the world. And they had that conference in Trinidad and Tobago um, in 2015. And uh, this was presented to them and um, again endorsed. And it's been presented and discussed at a number of uh, editions of World Press Freedom Day celebrations convened by UNESCO in different uh, countries around the world. It's originally produced in English, but has been translated into three other languages, Portuguese, Arabic, and French. Uh, it's also been distributed mainly online, but also uh, hard copies have been distributed at different events around the world. Uh, the African Commission adopted a resolution in uh, 2016, which also endorsed the uh, declaration and uh, mandated the special rapporteur to use it to um, elaborate or update the declaration of principles that I, I referred to earlier. So these are the various ways that we've uh, sought to uh, disseminate this and uh, increase its profile and status so that um, uh, people find it much more valuable for their advocacy and implementation activities. And just to close, one final example of that was that it inspired the development of uh, a bill on digital rights and internet freedom in Nigeria, uh, which was passed by the National Assembly. Unfortunately, the current president did not uh, assent to it, so it's not become law, but uh, we are still engaged in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edith, and also for such a detailed account uh, and for uh, really giving the sense of how far uh, these documents can travel if uh, they are uh, supported 
Um, that's extremely interesting. But then, of course, uh, we come to the last question, and I, I here invite actually short comments uh, so that we can also save some time for question and answer. And the last question is about how relevant these documents are uh, in the current uh, times. So on the one side, of course, uh, we've all been affected by the pandemic and, and we've seen how in many, in many cases, uh, fundamental rights have been uh, somehow uh, marginalized and put aside or concerns are not as, um, as much at the center of stage uh, due to other priorities. So what could be the role of these uh, documents? And also, I guess, uh, we have a question that is often posed by talking to young people. To what extent do you think that these documents are also well known, understood and appreciated, maybe even outside the communities of those who are directly involved? Marianne, you now have uh, again the floor. Thank you for three minutes uh, answer. Thank you. So we have three uh, documents. Uh, um, I think uh, I think the issues are even more relevant. I think we are International Human Rights Day. We have issues around media freedoms. We have a man currently um, in jail waiting for a court order as to whether he'll be extradited, namely Julian Assange. We have an, uh, a Moroccan journalist who's just been bunged in prison because the authorities didn't like what he had to say. Uh, and we have enormous issues now with human rights at the online offline nexus being constantly abused, undermined, hollowed out, ignored. Um, all these documents that I certainly have had the privilege to be close to work on directly or, or be privy to the discussions have put on the official agenda, human rights standards and law as these pertain to the online environment. And that means, that means there'd be new conversations. So, um, the bridging has been done, but the crossing of the bridge has yet to happen. People are still standing on each end of the bridge and there's not enough meeting in the middle and there's not enough thinking about the bridge itself as a means to preserve humanity and preserve also an internet that is human centered and not human corrosive. And by that, I also mean uh, in terms of its environmental impact. So the point about my last point I want to say about uh, are they still relevant is yes, 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 and yes. And the pandemic has revealed, in fact, the very issues that the Council of Europe, the um, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, our, our, our colleagues and friends on the African continent, is that human rights, human rights, no matter how much the human and the machine are close together, still need to be defended, enforced, and um, enabled to be enjoyed online, because that's where we live our lives. So too much mass online surveillance being put in place under the cover of COVID. Uh, and I feel that um, more important than ever, these, uh, these documents need to be in our schools, taken to our managements, taken to our hospital, taken to our procurement committees. So there's a lot of work to be done there. People do, students now understand the premise. In the years I've been putting this on the curriculum in general and specific terms, students understand the premise in ways they didn't a few years ago. They find the documents hard to read because it's legal language, but nonetheless, uh, they're more relevant than ever before. And we need to fight them to keep their place at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, so again, I'm, I'm giving the floor to Edith and uh, for the last uh, remarks. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm inviting all those participating. If you have comments or questions, just use the chat space because we do have some time for question and answer at the end of this uh, intervention. So the time uh, you may want to address this last question. What is the relevance of the document in the current times? And it, if its circulation and reception has been affected by the pandemic? Thanks once again. Yes, uh, the short answer to that question is that the declaration is still very relevant, um, particularly because the, the, the principles contained in it have really not changed. Um, of course, there have been some discussions within the coalition about the need to update it to capture some issues which have emerged in the last uh, few years since the declaration was developed and adopted. But principally, uh, the principles remain uh, relevant and valid. Uh, what has evolved uh, over the years is the application of the principles. And uh, I think we, within that framework, one may say that there are some gaps 
uh, that we did not anticipate at the time uh, the principles were developed because those issues have taken on prominence in the last few years. Again, when the declaration uh, was developed, so it, it had sought to place some emphasis on some issues that were uh, particularly relevant for the African continent. One of those key issues at that time was access and affordability. And I think that uh, remains uh, even uh, equally relevant today, but uh, maybe not as uh, bad as the situation was way back then. However, at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition came up with a, a position paper titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Digital Rights in Africa. And uh, the whole idea was to look at uh, certain uh, principles within the declaration and uh, do some analysis on how they had been impacted by COVID-19 and uh, the response of various governments on the continent to the pandemic. Uh, we selected five principles, which were around freedom of expression, access and affordability, privacy, uh, pers uh, personal data protection, uh, the right to information and gender, as well as uh, marginalized groups and groups at risk. And uh, the analysis and recommendations around these areas were uh, really hinged on uh, these principles and their application in a variety of sectors. So I, I, I think I would insist that the rights and principles in, of the internet remain constant. Uh, those have not really changed. And it's really in their application that we're seeing an evolution that uh, I think we need to respond to in the current age. So if we do get round to updating the declaration, um, essentially we'll be looking at how they apply to the current environment and perhaps try to be more uh, futuristic, forward-looking in developing the application of the principles because uh, there's a question to be asked about how often are we going to be updating and revising this. So uh, again, just to say short answer, uh, the document remains very um, relevant today and the principles are still quite valid. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if I may invite you to maybe share in the chat space the link to this document uh, and analysis on the five principles that you just mentioned, because I think that would be very relevant to any of us. Um, okay. And I see that we have one hand up, and then I'm inviting Dennis Redeker from Bremen University, who is also one of the operators here, uh, to let us know if there is any question or comment uh, in the chat space, uh, or if anyone else would like to take the floor. So with that, maybe uh, Henriette Esther Huizen, you can, you have the floor. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Edit, for doing such an incredible job as you always do with your attention to detail um apologies for for the the that link to the COVID paper not working i'll post the correct link um i just wanted to to really i think edit in some to some extent um underplayed how successful it has been and i think maybe that's because he's too modest but i think what we really managed to do with the declaration is to get resolutions passed by the African um, Commission on Human and People's Rights. And, and I think those resolutions, once they've been passed, including the new Declaration on Freedom of Expression that Edet mentioned, um, that means that when countries are being reviewed uh, in terms of the um, observance and promotion of human rights, we can put these things on the table. So I think in that sense, it's, it's been successful. Edit's organization has actually also undertaken strategic litigation um, inspired by, by the declaration. Um, I mean, I agree with everything he said about whether it's still valuable or not. I think what is disturbing for me really is that I think we, uh, on the one hand, having increased awareness of human rights and the power of the internet as a, as a platform for strengthening those. In some instances, I think we've also increased awareness of the need to repress the internet as a tool for human rights. And the incidence of internet shutdowns, for example, in Africa is far greater now than it was when we started this work. And, and I think there's a, there's a challenge here for us in our advocacy. You know, how do we 
actually counter this? How do we how do we stop the internet from being shut down or social media platforms being silenced during elections? So I think there's there's a real challenge there. And then I think the other challenge that I find, and maybe I'll come back to that in my closing remarks, is that I think, um, you know, this bridge there are many bridges that need to be crossed. And I think one of the bridges is that there's a disconnect between advocacy for social justice and advocacy for human rights in our space. And it's a very, very active uh, bridge. And I think as, as a movement that believes ultimately in both, and I do sincerely believe that the human rights advocates also care about social justice and that the social justice advocates also care about human rights. I think we've got to find a way of bridging this divide and developing a common project in our advocacy and internet governance, or we simply will not be effective. Thank you very much. And thank you also because you are actually pointing to uh, one of my own concern. And actually, I do have a question, unless uh, we do have uh, from the chat. Please, Dennis, do we have comments or question yet? So far, we don't have a, a comment or a question yet. Um, so I invite everyone to think about your questions now for the QA that starts now. Otherwise, I'd hand back the floor to you, Claudia. Yes, we still have five minutes before the end of the session. Claudia. So while we wait uh, uh, for anyone else to maybe post question, I think uh, it would have been very interesting to hear from Parminder Singh and the experience of the JustNet coalition, precisely because they have also this attempt of not only engaging other constituencies in the development of the document, but really keeping the document as, a, as an open space, uh, uh, precisely to bridge uh, with those other movements uh, that are uh, calling and claiming for social justice and for environmental justice and for you know, family issues. Uh, and so I do have a, a, a question here for Marianne and Edita and also related to how you see, what are the challenges uh, in building those bridges? Uh, what, what do you see the challenge? So is it a matter of resources, of space, uh, of languages? Uh, of um, not having like enough occasions uh, uh, to meet or what, what have been in the past, maybe some spaces that would have allowed uh, that bridge to be made uh, and maybe we no longer have those. I'm just thinking about the, the, social, the, the World Social Forum, of course, but similar. So Marianne and Edetine really in one minute uh, answer each. And then I see that Michael has his hand up. Marianne first. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is the oral transcript, the transcript of conversations. Uh, there are the written uh, evidence. Uh, it's about um, constantly reminding people of the connections that Henrietta brought up as well. Human rights and social justice are indispensably connected. All the UN documents are on human rights and arguments about human rights are premised on an assumption that we are striving for better, uh, more just world. People disagree how to get there the shape of the bridge, the style of the materials used, but those bridges need to be crossed all the time, backwards and forwards all the time. So one can never let up. It's always a base one conversation, right up to conversations with people you've been working with for years and reminding ourselves of fundamental, some fundamental terms and how much they matter. And that's all for now. Thank you, Mariana. And also you would like in one minute to speak to this issue? Claudia, hey, can you hear me? Yes, um, yeah. so I, I think that uh, the, the challenges are quite many, but uh, just to quickly say that one of the challenges we are confronting is the uh, reality of uh, terrorism at the, at the moment, which a lot of governments hide under to uh, violate rights, to restrict access to the internet, to shut down the internet and, and so on. And it's very difficult even for ordinary people to um, understand that uh, that response uh, may not be the right uh, response all the time uh, because sometimes really shutting down the internet or restricting access to uh, the digital space does not address the fundamental question, but it's often used as the, the, the excuse and people feel like they have to make a choice between the exercise and enjoyment of their rights uh, and um, the, the security that uh, government claims to be 
uh, providing. So that's often a very difficult challenge because people then say, oh, but yeah, how, how, how else can we deal with the uh, problem of terrorism? On the African continent also, uh, I think the, the, the problem of uh, illiteracy and ignorance is quite stark and also makes uh, advocacy uh, extremely difficult because uh, when people don't have an appreciation of the human rights standards and principles, then it's difficult to uh, really make them understand that these are rights that they have and should be entitled to uh, enjoy and exercise. And of course, there's also the issue of uh, access, uh, sometimes linked to uh, poverty, but also the absence of uh, infrastructure to uh, support uh, meaningful access. So. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about all of the challenges that uh, confront uh, this issue, uh, but I, I think that uh, uh, I am hopeful that uh, with time we would overcome many of these challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much for pointing to concrete specific uh, challenges. Uh, uh, and as anticipated, now I give uh, the floor back to Michael. I wonder if you had a question or if you're just uh, re resuming your role as an MC. So, Michael, please. Thank you, Cloud. Thank you, Claudia. I'm trying. I've been told I need to speak closer to the mic. Sorry for everyone in the room, but uh, I just wanted to invite anyone in the room as well. Just to, if you have a question, if you have a comment that you'd like to share, please you can come up to the mic over here and ask your question. It you know we're really trying to take advantage of the hybrid approach as much as we can. Um, if no one has a question at any time, then Claudia, we can give it back to you if you have any closing remarks for this for this section, or uh, I can also close out the section and, and then hand off to Dennis. If Please, I think, well, I would just like to thank all the speakers, uh, but of course uh, we have more coming up, so certainly we can move on to the next. And thank you, Michael. My pleasure. I just I just want to say as a, as a quick note uh, to, to close the section you know we anybody that's struggle that's fighting for whether it's social justice environmental rights human rights it's especially with the rise in authoritarianism and isolationism that is is you know it just it, i used to work for instance in media development you're looking at media freedom um, you know year on year media freedom around the world just seems to be getting worse it's very easy to get to get sucked up into the narrative that just everything's always getting worse, you know, we're always losing the battles, when in reality, especially if you look at the legal system, if you look at um, a lot of the things that are happening around the world, there are developments, there are wins and whatnot. And of course, wins don't necessarily always get the same press that the lo losses do. So it's just a really good reminder to stay resilient, to continue to network with people, with like-minded people who um, who are also striving to create a more fair and just and you know, rights-respecting world. And with that said, um, I think that is uh, a good chance now to hand the floor over to our next moder right, uh, sorry, our next moderator for session two, section two, which is uh, Dennis Radica. Dennis, uh, a wonderful human, over to you. Thank you, Michael, so much. And, and thank you for also bringing in the room uh, in Katowice. This is so important uh, to really live this hybrid uh, environment. Um, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. Now, the second session, uh, second section, uh, is actually focused very much on not the global transnational and international charters and documents, but instead we are going to look at uh, national initiatives that sometimes relate to these, that um, are sometimes derived perhaps from these, uh, but that are very much important as well as to bring into human, in, bring into uh, the digital environment human rights considerations. Originally, we have two speakers for this section or for this part of the section for this round table. I see already uh, Anna Neves being here. It's wonderful to have you. Um, I am not sure about Carlos. Um, are you here or in a room? In Poland, I can't. I can see that. Okay, so we're now starting off uh, only with one person at the round table. Um, but this should not be um, Marianne. Introduce Sean. Uh, Sean, uh, perhaps you could speak for the Just Net Coalition, uh, which is. I don't know if this is appropriate, Dennis. I just wanted to flag that. If Sean okay. is there, I've just heard from Paminda. Hi, Sean. Good to see uh, you. Hi. Yeah, yeah. I, just emailed, I just emailed. I just emailed myself. Uh, to see where he was. 
Uh, but no, I'm not really prepared at this point. I could certainly talk about the coalition, its objectives, uh, how it works, why it seeds itself as necessary. But in this context, I think Parminder is, is the one who would have to um, comment directly. Well, what we can do is we now have this um, round table on national initiatives uh, and the Just Net, uh, Net Coalition obviously is not a national uh, coalition, um, initiative. We see whether we have one or two speakers for this part. And otherwise, we have a little bit more time in the Q&A. And maybe you want to come in then with some comment and maybe anyone else who's in the room. I've saw, seen uh, Wolfgang Benedict also joining the room. So, I mean, there, there's some people who have something to say, but we first want to focus on national initiatives. Uh, and with that, I... I um, want to introduce my currently um, uh, only speaker on the round table, Anna Neves, uh, who is a advisor to the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education of Portugal. She's also a member of the Bureau of the Commission of Science, Technology and Higher Education uh, in Portugal. Uh, she's an IGF veteran. Uh, she covered uh, the Internet Governance Forum on behalf of the government of Portugal from uh, 2009 to 2019. Um, and today she will present the case of the Portuguese Charter of Human Rights in the Digital Era. Welcome, Anna. It's good to have you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning for you too, all. I would Just like... Yeah, please. Yes, just to mention that I'm a member of, of the Bureau of the CSTD, the Commission on Science, Technology and, and the Development of the UNCTAD, uh, where the resolution uh, for the uh, on, on the WIDIS is uh, discussed. And uh, so I'm a member uh, of, of the Bureau on behalf of the, the Western uh, Europe and the uh, other uh, countries. And uh, so it's very um, interesting to be back to the IGF and uh, to, to be part of this uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach and the uh, ambience, et cetera. So. It's very good to have you, <laughs> have you back, yes. Um, now, I'd like to talk about the Portuguese charter. Uh, yes. My first question relates to um, oh, I mean, it's a, it's a new charter on the block, so to say. We've heard of some yes. other charters. It's relatively new. Um, so my first question would be, um, how did it come about? Uh, how, did, how did the charter emerge in this environment? Okay, so uh, Portugal held the, the presidency of the Council of the European Union in the first half of this year, so from uh, January to June, during which the Lisbon Declaration on Digital Rights was approved in June uh, to, uh, to 2021 as a kickstart for a future possible EU Charter on Digital Rights to strengthen the human dimension in the digital ecosystem. Uh, so, uh, in preparing this debate at the uh, European Union's level, uh, Portugal approved uh, in April this year, the first charter of digital rights, which was signed into law by the Portugal's president in May, putting aligned the Portuguese and European agendas on the joint commitment to the ethical dimension in the digital era, along with the trust-based partnerships with other countries and continents that share European principles and values. So this is the, the context. Why a Portuguese charter and how did it come about? So we were trying to, uh, uh, to do some work on this at the EU's level and, uh, and, and then we did it uh, ours uh, at national level. Oh. Can you tell me a little bit, because we have a little bit more time, obviously, when the, the second speaker isn't present, can you tell me a little bit more, ask a little bit more about the, the process about which you've developed this? Is this a process um, run by the ministry involving uh, broader um, parts of the population? How was this uh, no. created? It was, uh, it was a movement from the, the Portuguese parliament. So together with the government. And uh, so it was a very uh, interesting process. It was uh, actually top down, uh, but um, it 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 uh, it embeds on uh, what uh, people are asking, and uh, so it was a very uh, inclusive uh, movement. And we are still uh, doing something about it, but I will explain. Uh, more about it in the in the second question that I think you have for me. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in explaining a little more on the, on this uh, ch charter. So it was really a, a top down uh, approach, uh, but with the inclusiveness of uh, of citizens. And, uh, and then we had the government involved, of course. And at the end, it is uh, a law. It is the highest diploma that you can have in Portugal. Thank you for sharing that. Approved, you over... approved by the parliament and by the parliament. Uh, endorsed by the, by the president of the republic. Yeah, thank you. Um, now you're already alluding to the second question, obviously. Um, so I, I'd be interested in how you think that the charter can make a difference um, in a, a national digital environment. Yes. So here I would like to share with you uh, some of the provisions that are in the charter and uh, that and some uh, raised some questions, uh, but it was interesting because it was always on the freedom component. So the charter establishes a set of innovative standards regulating the digital national environment, such as the rights and duties that apply both to relations between the state and the citizens and to relations exclusively between private individuals. It includes the need to coordinate the provisions of the charter with other legislation already approved or about to be approved as a result of various European initiatives regulating the digital env environment, notably the general data protection regulation, the law on uh, electronic communications privacy, e-privacy, uh, the ongoing transposition of the directive uh, on copyrights in the digital single market, the proposal for a European regulation harmonizing the rules on artificial intelligence, uh, which we call Artificial Intelligence Act, and the proposal for the Digital Services Act, as well as the recent formulation of a set of principles to promote and uphold uh, European Union values in the digital space. The Charter uh, creates the social tariff for internet access services. Uh, it includes the prohibition of intentional interruption of internet access, uh, which can only occur in statutory situations subject to special law. Uh, it includes the right to net neutrality, ensuring the absence of discrimination regarding the transmission and reception of content via the internet, the provision of a right to a digital will, meaning this right covers the possibility for people to dispose of their content and personal data on digital platforms after their death. Despite the significant number of ongoing European initiatives in the context of online content regulation, this charter defines disinformation as any demonstrably false or misleading narrative created, presented and disseminated for economic advantage or deliberately deceiving the public and which is likely to cause public harm including a threat to democratic political processes, public policymaking processes, and public goods. Closely related to the, the, the disinformation, the Charter establishes that the state should create fact-checking structures by duly registered media companies, as well promote the attribution of quality seals by trustworthy entities endowed with public utility status, causing a lot of discussion. So this part uh, caused a lot of discussion and is still uh, on, ongoing. The protection of platforms users is also strengthened in the charter by establishing the obligation to provide clear and simple information on conditions of service provision when using platforms that enable information and communication flows. The charter also pays particular attention to the protection of minors uh, as for the means granted to individuals to protect their rights and legal situations under the Charter, besides the recognition of the possibility to resort to procedural and material means of enforcement of rights and legal situations, the right to resort to popular action is also established, which means that anyone can, uh, can put, uh, can go to the court uh, and um, 
without any payment. Finally, uh, uh, we note that non-profit legal persons educated to promoting and defending the provisions of the Charter are entitled to obtain the status of public utility entity under the terms of the legislation applicable to cultural entities. But due to its rather broad scope, only further regulation and implementation of this rule will clarify and many doubts raised by it. So it's very good because we are having a, a very good discussion. It's always about uh, freedom and uh, the right to, uh, to, to inform and the right hands and uh, what these, um, uh, these uh, fact, fact checking structures uh, means. So here we are having a lot of discussion and so, and uh, uh, there will be some uh, regulation to implement that. So the charter into, into, into force on the 16th, on, on the 18th of July this year. So I hope I, I cover- this, uh, this is absolutely comprehensive. Uh, thank you so yes. much. You, you talked well, a lot about the I had content, some which is, more time. I know I this is really good. This is really good. And I think that I already saw some, some questions maybe in the chat, well, you know, so there'll be some Q&A in, in a second. So you now told us a little bit about the content. Uh, you certainly also um, pointed at um, the mechanisms by which this actually has impact. Obviously, it's a law in Portugal oh, and it, it, it helps uh, also with the um, with transposing EU regulations into into Portuguese. Uh, into the Portuguese environment, uh, and you told us also a little bit about the uh, uh, to, background. To, to try to influence European Union as well. And, and, and with that, exactly. Um, I, I want to quickly ask everyone who's listening also in the room in Poland to think of questions. Please post them in the chat if you're on Zoom, um, because we're going to start with a Q&A uh, in a second. Um, if I may, I would just before handing it over um, to the online moderator, ask that one last question, which you just alluded to, is um, what is the impact on the EU discourse, right? So Portugal made this um, in this step in a way also in the presidency uh, in order to influence the EU discussion. How do you see this uh, being successful or, you know, how do you see this progressing in the future? Well, I already mentioned that during the presidency of the of the Council of the European Union, uh, we uh, make this Lisbon Declaration, uh, which was uh, approved by the by the Council, and uh, so uh, it is the Lisbon De Declaration on Digital Rights, and this uh, was approved by the Council of the European Union in June, and. Uh, and it, uh, it is foreseen to be like a kickstart for a future possible EU Charter on Digital Rights. But you know that nowadays uh, it's a bit difficult to discuss uh, these, um, these, uh, these rights uh, in the EU's environment. But of course, we have to, to push for it. And um, when we, we propose this Lisbon Declaration on Digital Rights, um there was a very good discussion it was possible uh, to have it uh, endorsed by all the member states um but uh, um, its annex uh, about fundamental rights was not possible to be endorsed by all the member states but it's a process it's a process uh, so uh, and with this lisbon declaration on digital rights uh, we affirm the commitment of EU in respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms in the areas of the new technologies, data, product and digital service flows and the use of personal uh, data. And uh, in the context of a digital transition uh, that we are aware uh, may aggravate existing inequalities. So this was really a national movement because we had this context of, of the presidency and we, we seized the opportunity uh, to, 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 to launch uh, a declaration on digital rights. And, uh, and now we are discussing at EU's level uh, principles and the values of the world. 
Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Absolutely. So the, uh, obviously Lisbon um, uh, Charter was uh, um, uh, important. Um, so um, starting with the Q&A now, I'm, I'm looking actually to Jacob, who is the, the master of the online Q&A for now. Have you had any questions? Otherwise, we do have a hand up uh, from Marianne, who's, who's very eager to say something. Um, Jacob. Yes. Uh, hello. Hi, Jacob. Uh, we have two hands up here by Marianne, uh, three hands now, uh, Henriette and Wolfgang. But I just want to quickly uh, give it to you and for the online questions, if there are any. Sorry, I don't. I don't see any uh, questions in the chat yet. So. I think we can take those who have raised their, their hand now. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to start Dennis, with- and I'm yes, sorry. Claudia. So if we have uh, Marianne, Henriette, and Benedek, um, and I think he was invited to speak briefly about the, the Council of Europe initiative, uh, which we didn't hear in the previous, I think also Shano, Shono Shokro is uh, willing to say something about the Just Net Coalition, so we can actually um, have uh, uh, those comments that we didn't have before. Thank you. Absolutely. But I like to ask all speakers, obviously, to um, limit uh, how long they speak to about one minute. Uh, thank you. Yes, I just want to put on the table the Marco Seville, uh, reading straight from their booklet. It passed into law in 2014. The Marco Seville sets forth a comprehensive Bill of Rights for the Internet. And uh, it was very much um, based on a very broad national uh, civil society consultation uh, framework. And that's why the Marco Civil is so important. Not only was civil society involved, but it also became law in 2014. Uh, the final version protects rights such as net neutrality, privacy, and takes a strong stance against um, surveillance online practices. Uh, and it also protects freedom of expression, creating safe harbors for online intermediaries in Brazil and internet platforms have to take down content only when served with a valid court order. In short, the Marco Seville translates the principles of the Brazilian constitution to the online world. Uh, it can serve as an example to countries willing to take seriously the importance of the net to facilitating both development and a rich and open public sphere. So the Marco Seville is now in English, and this is very important for others uh, who don't speak Portuguese uh, to get a sense of this actual law, uh, one of the first laws based on human rights um, law and principles. That's just all I have to say because I can't speak much more than that, except it was a very inspiring process and document for the Char Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet and remains so. Thank you so much, Marianne. This is very important. Obviously, the other speaker in this panel who's unfortunately not able to make it I would have talked about Marco Silva more. So we had more time for, to, for the Portuguese, a very important uh, document. Um, but thank you very much, Marianne, for feeding this back in. Uh, on Next on my list of speakers would be Henriette. Um, thanks, Dennis. Um, just to share a bit, um, you know, just general with, with APC, which is a membership organization, uh, what we've seen, and I think this is how these, the IRP charter, but also the African declaration can really operate, is that it gets at a national level, um, uh, civil society, particularly like cross-sectoral civil society involved. And we've seen an increase in people using the universal periodic review process of the Human Rights Council. So it took a little bit of advocacy and it was a good example of national advocacy connected with global advocacy. Because what we did in Geneva was to make the Human Rights Council aware that they need to pay attention. Um, and of course the resolution um, there was very important. And what we now see is that people use something like the African Declaration to submit reports into the universal uh, period, periodic review process. Um, so that's been very, and, and we see that in, in APC members all over the world. And then the other thing, and I think Anna really illustrated this, is legislation. It's using these instruments to, to as a basis for submission on draft um, legislation. And then just quickly about South Africa, we actually considered doing a micro-civil, but in the end, what we're doing is just applying the constitution 
to new legislation and work with the Human Rights Commission on that as well, because we've got quite a strong national human rights framework. And sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, but we have a new Cyber Crimes Act that's actually just been signed uh, uh, into uh, uh, effect by the president. And that Cyber Crimes Act is very influenced by this human rights perspective. And we're actually quite happy with how it deals with criminalizing non-consensual sharing of, of intimate images, for example. It also does criminalize um, certain types of, of, of malicious uh, use of social media, but we feel the definitions are specific enough to be, to be quite effective. So that's just an example, but none of this would have happened if we didn't have these tools like the IRP Charter, like the African Charter, because it just makes it simpler than, than working directly with human rights law. Ultimately, you have to work with human rights law, but this makes it easier to get there. Thank you so much for sharing that insight um, into the work of APC and also the uh, work in South Africa. Um, next on the list here, we have uh, Wolfgang Benedek uh, talking about the Council of Europe um, guide uh, in a very quick one minute uh, contribution. Thank you. Mariana might have explained that this guide was uh, kind of initiated by our charter of the coalition, uh, but the guide had a much more uh, restrictive uh, approach uh, with regard to the rights covered. So it's focused on the main rights like freedom of expression, data protection and so on. And uh, it had uh, mainly an educative purpose also. And this is why it was then also translated in a number uh, of uh, languages, in English certainly, in German, in French, and what have you. Um, so uh, in that sense, it was uh, had a different approach. Uh, in uh, what, what I realized when I looked at it again was that we were focusing on blocking and filtering, also anonymity at the time. Uh, but uh, what was not so much there was what Anna just mentioned, like the issue of disinformation, hate speech, etc. Mm -hmm. um, this is something which we brought up in our uh, second edition of the book, uh, some of you might have seen, which I did together with Matthias Kettemann, and which is on freedom of expression on the internet and came out last year. Uh, so uh, that was an update uh, to these uh, new developments. What I sometimes realize is that there are new efforts uh, for such a list of rights documents, uh, which do not take sufficiently existing materials into account. For example, in Germany, uh, they started with a kind of chart of digital rights, and I had not the feeling that they had looked at what has been done before properly. Um, I don't know if you mentioned the Italian effort a couple of years ago, that was one of the first ones in the Italian parliament. So we have these national um, efforts and, and regional ones and universal ones, maybe about 50 different uh, tools in the meantime. And I think Matthias Kettemann has written an article on a kind of comparison uh, uh, some time ago. Um, but uh, what I miss a bit is uh, that they inform each other properly and that they are taken care of when you do new and uh, renewed efforts. And certainly now the issue is, as it was discussed uh, frequent, uh, repeatedly now in the IGF, uh, to update uh, these to the new challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. And if I may just quickly uh, some advertisement for the work of the Digital Constitutionalism Network, because I've seen also in the, in the chat, you, you just mentioned there are so many documents. We have now the Portuguese uh, charter, who's not, which is not included yet, but there's a big database of more than 200 documents that includes national initiatives, uh, local initiatives, uh, transnational initiatives, and also some of the, um, the guiding documents uh, published by the Council of Europe. Uh, UNESCO and other international organizations. Um, that is, uh, I think there was a link just posted somewhere uh, in the chat uh, where you can go and, and check out where the document that you've been working on is actually included and hopefully so. If not, uh, please do tell the members of the Digital Constitutions Network that co-host this workshop. Um, and now with that one, um, I'd like to, um, the one document that's certainly in there is the Delhi Declaration. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to, uh, uh, to Sean.
Thanks. And I will be brief. I have no idea what Parminder was going to say, by the way. <laughs> and I can not speak on behalf of the uh, JustNet Coalition, but I can I, I speak from my experience of the JustNet Coalition and, and being an active member in it. And I, I think the starting point of the Just, JustNet Coalition is that, first of all, the freedom of expression, um, data protection, this kind of thing, these issues, these human rights are extremely important. But it is also very, very important to emphasize the other side of human rights, uh, and that is the economic and social rights um, and uh, political rights, or uh, economic and social rights. And that sometimes they don't get the same level of attention in the bigger picture in the processes that are going on here. So the JustNet coalition began with that proposal. And then after the Delhi Declaration, it produced the uh, digital um, just uh, the JustNet a uh, digital justice uh, manifesto. Now that was uh, I just put a link to it there. Uh, that was you know a pretty well uh, consulted uh, consultative process in producing it. I think it's a it's a pretty sound document. But to be honest with you, as you yourself mentioned there, uh, Dennis, there are hundreds of declarations. There are really there are so many. They just they just keep reproducing now. In this session, we've talked about some of the important, well-grounded ones that are actually being used, and these are vital that they should go on. But simply working on declarations is it's not going to get us uh, all that far. So JustNet at the moment has moved into what's being called loosely JustNet uh, 2.0. And uh, th this is a project. It's, it's a funded um, program and initiative. Uh, and what it's doing is bringing together actors in the economic and social rights area, international uh, NGOs, and putting them together with experts in the areas uh, that we're talking about here um, in, in terms of the internet, uh, in terms of AI, in terms of uh, AI governance, all of these issues. Because these sectors such as agriculture, health or trade and labor, media, they know that the world is changing. In fact, the rug is being from pulled from underneath their feet uh, a lot of the time. And yet it's very, very difficult for in some of these sectors for them to appreciate uh, what is really going on in the internet and the AI governance world. And believe me, I, I by the way, I'm in my apartment here in snowy Katowice. I haven't made it up there yet today. Um, but it is so complicated to try and work out what the hell is going on and who is doing what and who are all the actors and how do you influence and what buttons do you press. So, you know, for these um, for these sectors, what they really need is some kind of trustworthy interlocutor, but also uh, to develop their own principles. And the idea of the um, uh, JNC 2.0 is that these sectors are each of them working on what are the core principles that they think would apply within their own area around things like data ownership around you know all the key issues that are, are coming up data commons all of this stuff and then towards the end of the program later in the year to get them together and actually there was a session on monday that i was involved in myself where for the first time i met a number of the actors uh, as well in in uh, in that activity but later in the year to get them together to produce very much a ground up uh, set of principles so hopefully it wouldn't be just yet another set of these things but it'll be one that would have the backing as well of some key international ngos um, who would have worked collectively on this and therefore not necessarily come to a full consensus but at least will have come to a deeper much deeper understanding than uh, they began with maybe of of the potential of the buttons that you do have to uh, press but also on the principles that really are going to have to underline this whole process if uh, it's to move forward so it, it's only a first step but i think it is a useful step and, and that's the main focus of the justna coalition at the moment thanks very much thank you so much for sharing this is a great insight and it really also speaks to the, the question of so many charters out there and how do you actually make them work right i have a hand up from, from claudia and actually we are at the end of this Q&A and uh, you yes. know, not so many questions actually for Anna, but I think she also uh, talked already comprehensively about uh, the very interesting uh, Portuguese uh, example uh, that is set uh, and put into law. Um, Claudia. It's just a very, very brief uh, um, uh, comment and follow up to what Dennis was saying, because I think it's relevant to what uh, Sean just described uh, in terms of upcoming commitment and the intention of JustNet Coalition in this uh, second phase. 
I think the collection of documents uh, that sits in the website of the Digital Constitutionalism Network uh, may actually be an interesting resource even for developing this kind of dialogue and the uh, conversation between different groups, also because of the documents have been coded according to themes and topics. And so different constituencies may actually find uh, uh, meaningful elements in there to get a better understanding of how to develop the principle. So it's just a point uh, for Sean. And of course, we look forward to follow the, closely the process. It's extremely interesting. Thank you so much. I need to move on to the next uh, session. So Absolutely. Jacob. Yeah. Yes. Not take the thank floor. you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Claudia. So uh, I think so far we have looked at this IGF-led human rights document. Uh, we have looked at how they came about, their impact. We have seen examples from uh, of these digital human rights frameworks uh, in the national context. Uh, but this uh, session, we are going to basically look at the, uh, the the future, you know, digital rights future. And we are basically going to look at it from, you know, local initiatives. What can basically be done uh, to ensure that we are able to advance our uh, local initiatives uh, concerning human rights uh, online? And at this session, uh, my confirmed speakers, uh, Ike uh, Van Emeren from the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. And then we have uh, Rashi, who is an RIPC. Uh, steering committee member and uh, represents the youth uh, constituency. So uh, basically I'll lump, I have two questions, but I'll basically lump them to one. So one is that how do IGF, uh, IGF led documents support, support local initiatives in their commitment to advance human rights online? And then uh, linking that to what else can be done to support local initiatives and to help advance digital rights digital human rights. So in fact, any of my speakers can uh, look at this briefly and, and, and share your thoughts based on uh, the work that you're doing uh, on the ground. So either Ike or Rashi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. I just wanted to check if you all can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I think it's a very, very difficult question question <laughs> to consolidate into two minutes, but I'm going to try to uh, be as I'm going to try to give my perspective. I think the the IGF related documents are great educational perspectives. I do come from the global south where I still feel that the legislation is lagging behind on a lot of aspects. And I come from India where we do have a very strong implementation issue. So I think the IGF documents um, has made a lot of people aware about how um, your human rights can actually be translated into the digital world. A lot of aspects are allowed or are seen as okay without taking your personal consent. So I think one of the big things that are missing uh, in our digital lives is to ensure the same degree of protections that we enjoy in our real life interactions. Um, but the problem is that from a technical standpoint of view in terms of holding people accountable, we don't have a technical language to define what we want to protect. So we lack taxonomies related to it. Um, even if you look at GDPR, which is a great example of legislation, it doesn't really indicate any implementation details. It gives us a very vague description to verify compliances unless you hire a really expensive consultancy and review your code and declare them as compliant. So, um, you know, people, big tech companies are okay with paying those billions and millions of fines without actually complying. So we lack the technical language that we are unable to engage with who are the frontliners of the domain, which is the technologists. You need people to understand, um, you know, understand because we need to make sure that we have a commonly accepted definition of, of of you know of universal digital rights because we can all have these conversations with global north and global south but if you don't have a commonly understandable definition that you can understand and embrace then we're always going to be a part of the problem than the solution so um, some of the things that I've done locally, or rather I'm doing with the IO Foundation, we, we, we define something called the universal, uh, you know, the UDDR. So it's the universal digital rights, where we think that we need to start engaging citizens um, and, you know, helping frontline workers, I mean, frontline workers in, in this sense, technologists, as the next generation of human rights defenders. 
Um, so we, we, we look at proposing three elements of this. We firstly look towards promoting a data-centric approach to digital rights, um, which consists of a legal document, uh, a, a technical standard, and we would call a digital rights software development kit. Um, I'm happy to go more into details, but I'm not sure if I'm running out of time or not. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Rashi. I think you have you've, you've shared your perspective uh, given the time that we have. Uh, so I will turn to Ike, uh, Ike van Eberen. It's always the thing with Dutch names, but yes. I, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, there, that's perfect. No, I, um, I, I, I think in, in two, two minutes, that, that's always complicated, but I, I think that the, the best part to mention, and, and I'm not sure if uh, Marianne Franklin uh, remembers, and I know uh, Minna Morera does, uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago at MOSFEST, that's, that was the first part that when a group of people from several cities uh, came together during, during, well, in a small room uh, next to the MOSFEST event in London, and everyone had these wild ideas like, well, cities we can make change and 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 we we can do stuff and then suddenly a lot of people have been thinking about these topics for for years and years and already had frameworks and well thought through concepts and um i think that's that's bottom line it um we can share a lot of links uh, on all the documents who are there but in the end it's about um, meeting people you can you you well you just met but you think okay i can trust them because they have well thought this well, 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 thought this through, and we can just copy paste and uh, translate it to 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 our view or uh, our local issues. So that's bottom line. It um, since then uh, we formed uh, a cities coalition, a cities coalition for digital rights, which is if you read the the Portuguese charter, which I'm pretty impressed with uh, Anna Naves, um, uh, sort of similar. Uh, different set of numbers on principles, but in the end, it's it's the same charter. But different um, and and well uh, uh, tailored to to problems at cities, um, and I think the main focus we had in the last few years is not um, uh, is not only working or specifying the charter. It's more about okay, what what can we do? So I'd like to give you a few examples because that's you. It's sort of this butterfly effect. You have no idea what's actually happening the moment you start one of these sessions. One is um, those principles of the, the, the charter in the end resulted in a lot of different uh, projects within the Cities Coalition. And I'm putting some in the chat. Um, an example, last week we, and I'm not talking only about the whole Cities Coalition, but an example in Amsterdam, every uh, sensor, if you want to, to gather information in public space, you have to register. Uh, there's one example. Together with Helsinki, uh, several cities amongst Amsterdam uh, worked on an AI registry. Every algorithm used by cities, uh, at least in, in our sphere and in the near future, hopefully also in public space, has to be regist uh, registered. So those are really concrete examples uh, where the charter in the end uh, led to. But it's not only local perspective, it's real people's, real people lives, problems and solutions with end up turning a little bit more big as well. Um, one example is an AI procurement uh, 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 document we wrote. Every algorithm we procure has to, well, uh, uh, align with, 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 with the checks we want. Uh, probably will be adopted by uh, the European Commission. So in the end, uh, bridging uh, very abstract principles to concrete solutions, uh, leads to, well, simple examples, which uh, are being copy paste and improved uh, by other cities. And in this case, um, you've been as well. Now I'm giving some, because of time, some examples from my city, um, uh, but the coalition is, is now 50, 55 cities worldwide working on this together with weekly workshops, uh, weekly meetings, uh, webinars among these cities. So, um, before you think it's only about the charter, it's about the moral support you can give, knowing that there are more and more people working on this. And that's, that's the last example of what I would like to give. Uh, two months ago, uh, 13 deputy mayors from major cities in Europe came together during uh, COVID, discussing, okay, what should be your next political ambition? What, what should be the topics to focus on? 
So the charter gave people confidence that you're not alone. We can uh, deliver concrete examples which can be spread again. And in the end, it gives support to uh, to at least politicians at at at, at, uh, at our level. So okay, we we we've we've got issues here, and we should tackle this. And it's definitely larger than cities, but this is what we can do at our scale. And I think it really helps uh, giving that back again. And that's uh, that's what happens. The last thing I'd like to share is that we um, uh, we went to a more detailed framework, and it's the zero point seven. Um, seventh version so please contribute because today it's the of course the the, the human rights day so today we we, we uh well at 12 o'clock we will, we will send, send send some some content this is the, the preview about okay if you translate this to a more policy framework so if you go from the first charter you made translate it into sort of more policy framework <laughs> what are the things we have to do so that's it when it comes and to yes yes thank you thank you very much thank you very much Ake. i i think you've I uh, really uh, shared a lot of perspectives and thank you for sharing the documents. Thank you, Rashi, as well, uh, because of time. But I would give about two minutes uh, to Claudia so that the students from Padova would share uh, their brief presentation. Yes, I realized that we're very late. So oh, yeah, we are. Sara <laughs> Boscaro from the University of Padova, maybe in just one minute uh, to say yeah. something about the experience they've had uh, with the Charter of Human Rights and Principles. Sara, you have the floor very, very briefly. Yes, sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Sara. And uh, together with my colleagues, uh, Dilara and Ibru, we recreated an advocacy campaign called the Interquality Campaign with the goals uh, of uh, spreading the knowledge about the 10 principles from the Charter of Human Rights and Principle of the Internet. Uh, to create the skeleton of the project, uh, we took into consideration the 10 most essential internet rights, and we tried uh, to reach a broader population uh, with the ambitious goal of educating the, the public uh, uh, about their rights uh, on uh, the internet. Uh, our campaign consists in a public uh, Instagram page that we created and curated. Uh, the posts are drawings of pictures that reflect uh, the principle, and under each uh, uh, and every one of uh, them, we wrote a uh, short uh, descriptions of the principle itself. Um, we chose uh, to use Instagram because it allows us to reach uh, a lot of people and it's pretty much uh, um, free. And also we found it uh, powerful to use uh, social media to warn people about their internet safety. Um, because we are such a uh, diverse group ourselves, uh, I'm from Italy, Dilara is from Germany, and Ibru is Turkish, uh, we decided to translate the, the descriptions of the principles in the languages that we speak, meaning Italian, uh, Spanish, uh, um, English, uh, Turkish, and German. We wanted to spread the message of the uh, 10 principles to as many people as, as uh, we possibly could, so we decided to be language inclusive and to maintain a fresh and easy way uh, of writing the captions. And we also, uh, that is also why the feed of our Instagram page looks uh, as aesthetic as possible, uh, because uh, we wanted to attract uh, as many young people as uh, we possibly can. Uh, the target of the population, as I said, are young people, because uh, we think that we need to be educated on uh, what our rights uh, are on the internet. So this project is a young take on such an important matter uh, made specifically for young people by young people. And uh, I will share the, um, the link to the Instagram page on the chat. And I hope everything is clear. Thank you, Sarah. We already have the link. So with this, uh, we give back the floor to Minda to close the session. I think the last speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... I would like to hear from Andriette first. So I would like, uh, uh, I don't have much to add, uh, just um, uh, organizing this session and, um, and, and sharing the coalition. And you have said so much and a lot of the things that I would like to share with you. So I would like to go straight to Andriette. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, um, Minda and then everyone else. And you know, I think I think we we Minda asked me to to reflect on on what this all means and how the IGF ecosystem fits into this and the other way around. I think we've really seen, firstly, and we should we should celebrate this on 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 Human Rights Day that this this IRP process, this IGF centered process, has really just grown and 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 has had a ripple effect 
at a sectoral level, at a national level, at a regional level. And I think sometimes we are criticized as civil society or as rights advocates for developing new charters, new documents. But I think that's part of the movement building process. And, and it's an expression of the, the, the kind of bottom up character of what we believe when we still believe, and I hope some of us still believe, that this kind of bottom up processes in internet governance do have some, some power. And I think the challenges are how do we connect it? How do we come together? And um, how do we bring that distributed advocacy and analysis and action and partnership, particularly when we start looking at policy frameworks? You know, listening to Ike and, and talking about that, and I think several people made that emphasis that we need to link the rights frameworks to policy frameworks in order to have impact. And that creates monitoring frameworks as well. So, and I, I see all of that emerging. So Minda, I think really for me, the, the challenge here is, as we said earlier, how do we build bridges between the social justice approach and the human rights approach? How do we find that, 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 that commonality, which I think most of us believe is at the center of our work. And there are political tensions, yes, and conceptual tensions, and, but can we work through them? And can we use the IJF Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles um, as a space to, to share our learning and share our progress and have critical debate as well? I believe we can. And, and I, I hope that JustNet Coalition with its new initiative, which is looking at issues again through sectoral civil society um, uh, lenses, that it will be part of this process. So I don't think it's easy. And I think I sense at this IGF and, and, and broadly as well in, in social and political movements, cynicism about the multi-stakeholder approach. And I think cynicism is, is, is only useful if it allows you to be analytical and critical and deconstruct, and then based on that, reconstruct. And I urge people not to give up on this IGF space. Flawed as it is, um, it, it does bring us together. And I do believe that if we use it effectively, we can still achieve meaningful partnerships, partnerships across stakeholder groups, like the work we heard of with mayors in, in, in the cities network, as well as uh, maintain a, a really a civil society, critical thinking, um, rights and social justice based approach. Back to you, Minda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining the session today. It was really, really inspiring. Uh, I know that we're running over time, so I would just uh, would like um, to say that co-sharing this uh, coalition for over the last uh, four years has been really uh, inspiring for me to see the work that the IGF community has been doing and, uh, and many other initiatives to raise awareness and to support human rights online. Um, I would like to thank everyone that uh, joined us today, uh, especially our um, uh, speakers and uh, uh, moderators, MC and, um, and rapporteur, and uh, everyone that uh, join in the discussion as well as participants. And uh, uh, I hope to see you again soon and that we have all the chance to collaborate and to work together. Because I think that the only way that we can make a difference is by joining forces. And this is very important, it was a very important session to show that there is so much being done. And sometimes you just need to start connecting the dots rather than to start from scratch every every time you want to do something. So uh, I am really happy that the Digital uh, Constitutionalist Network has this resource pages where we can all go, we can all see what has been done, and we can all see what is lacking. So I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. <laughs>